Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on preventing Alzheimer's disease by maintaining organic brain health. This is Fajit Saraj, and on behalf of United Scientific Group, a nonprofit organization, I thank you all for taking your time out and uh, being here with us today. And before I introduce our speaker, I would like to point out that this webinar is being recorded. So if you miss anything, don't worry about it because we'll be uploading the recorded webinar on our website. You can access it anytime. And also we'll be running a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. You can send us your question through the chat box or type it in the section of ask a question, which you will find at the bottom of your Zoom dashboard. Now I would like to take the opportunity to introduce Professor Mark B. Matson, who will be speaking on effect of intermittent bioenergetic challenges on brain and how it might prevent Alzheimer's disease. Professor Matson is a professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University, and he's one of the top experts on the health benefits of intermittent fasting on, on the body and brain. He and his research teams have shown that fasting can improve cognitive function and metabolic health. His work on intermittent fasting has been featured on several national media. He is also one of the foremost researchers in the area of cellular and molecular mechanism underlying neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. He is the former chief of the Laboratory of Neuroscience at the National Institute on Aging Intramural Research Program. Welcome, Professor Mark. Thank you for being here, and it's a great honor to have you here with us today. Thanks for the invitation, Fazi, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. I'm going to approach my talk from initially from a, a kind of a broad perspective, uh, in fact, an evolutionary perspective on how the human brain got to be the way it is and its superior cognitive capabilities. Because I think uh, in the long run, that's important to understand with regards to uh, reducing risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so our brains and the brains of animals in general uh, evolved uh, under conditions of food scarcity. So competition for limited amounts of food was a driving force for evolution. Obviously, if you don't get enough food, uh, you can't survive and reproduce. And so in this first slide in the upper left, it shows some wolves surrounding a buffalo. And during evolution uh, of these canines, individuals who would cooperate with each other uh, to kill an animal that an individual wolf couldn't kill alone would survive. So one can make the case that the social brain uh, and cooperation evolved uh, as an adaptation to food scarcity. Then next to that on the right is some um, hunter-gatherers in Africa. And as you know, most of your audience will know, all the earliest tools invented by humans were tools that had to do with obtaining and, and consuming food. So weapons, uh, stone tools uh, for processing food, fire. And, and so uh, there's a strong case that uh, the, bra the brains of individuals are adapted to functioning well under conditions of food deprivation or, or low food availability. And certainly our ancestors, uh, hunter-gatherers, did not eat three meals a day plus snacks every day. And their uh, energy availability varied throughout the year, depending on the season. OK. On the other hand, domesticated animals, dogs, and, and humans, which there's this, have undergone a process of self-domestication, uh, have constant access to food. They don't have to spend their time thinking about how to obtain food. They don't have to expend energy to obtain food. And so uh, many individuals now are overweight, and which is a risk factor for diabetes, and also Alzheimer's, cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. So we see this big contrast in terms of what our brains are adapted, conditions our brains are adapted to function well under and, 
and the modern day conditions which we're not adapted to. Okay, on this slide is just what I mentioned that if you, and this look is looking at the size of the brain essentially, a cranial volume uh, over time during human evolution. And there was a big increase in size of the brain that was strongly correlated with uh, ability to invent tools and other processes to obtain and process food, and then eventually agriculture. Uh, and about 10,000 years ago, domestication of plants and animals. And then at that point, uh, and many people had ready access to food all the time. This slide shows uh, just examples of what happens to an individual's blood glucose and ketone levels with different eating patterns. So this upper one is a typical American eating pattern, three meals a day plus an evening snack. So every time you eat, glucose levels go up and they come down, you know, insulin goes up and then glucose goes down. If you look at ketones with this eating pattern where the meals are spread out over like a 16 hour period, um, ketones stay low. And the reason is that it takes at least 10 hours uh, to deplete the glycogen stores in the liver, which is glucose. And it's only at that point that fats and the ketones derived from them uh, become elevated and, and there's this metabolic switch from using uh, glucose to ketone. So that's shown in this middle example where the person fasts for 24 hours, and then the next day eats three meals. So you can see, uh, you know, if the person doesn't eat breakfast, uh, somewhere, you know, late, late morning uh, or midday ketones go up and then they keep going up. Uh, and then this bottom example is, sorry, and this bottom example is that the person doesn't eat breakfast and then doesn't eat till like 1 p.m. And so the ketones are going up, uh, you know, mid-morning. Now, if the person was to exercise in the morning, then the, the ketones, like if they got up in the morning and went running, that's going to deplete glycogen stores, and then ketones will start to go up earlier and will be higher, actually, before they eat. So there's this additive effect of fasting and exercise in terms of this metabolic switch from carbohydrates, that is glucose, to fats and the ketones derived from the fats. Now, it had been shown uh, in the 1980s actually that every other day fasting, which is abbreviated EOD here, can greatly increase lifespan in rats and, and not shown here, mice. So this is the survival curves in rats fed ad libitum. That is, they have constant access to food. And by 100 uh, weeks, all the rats are dead. Whereas in the rats on every other day fasting, uh, at 100 days, you know, there's only a few, hardly any rats have died. And so there's about an 80% increase in average and maximum lifespan. The point being that intermittent fasting in animals, when it started at an early age, extends their lifespan. Um, interestingly, in, in calorie res daily calorie restriction studies in animals, where they divide the animals into two groups, uh, ad libitum, 40% calorie restriction, and they give the animals all their food in this group uh, at one time, what happens is because they have far fewer calories than normal, they eat all their food within a short time period. And so they're actually fasting for 
uh, up to 20 hours every day. And, and we think that there's actually uh, a major contribution of the fasting aspect of this calorie restriction to the increased longevity. Uh, this is a study uh, we did in mice uh, quite a while ago. And what we did is there's a certain strain of mice, the C57 black six, that when you put them on every other day intermittent fasting, which we abbreviate IF, they, on the days they do have food, they eat almost twice as much food uh, as they normally would. And so that their overall food intake over a period of weeks is not significantly different than the animals ad libitum. Uh, so if you actually looked at their daily food intake, it would be uh, twice as much as the control group on the days that the intermittent fasting group has food. And then, of course, zero food intake on the fasting days. And this shows the body weight. So these animals on intermittent fasting maintain their body weight uh, pretty close to controls. And yet they show improvements in glucose regulation as indicated by reduced plasma glucose and insulin levels. Um, and their ketones are up as you would expect on the, this was on the fasting day. And then they're, they're down on the, the feeding day. So they're going up and down every other day. Okay, let's get to Alzheimer's disease, which kind of the main focus here. Uh, as you know, as your listeners will know, a major risk factor for Alzheimer's is age. And this slide shows the distribution, age distribution of the U.S. population in the years 2010, 2030, and 2050, as color coded here. And what you see is there's a big increase just over a 20-year period in the number of people in this age range of 65 to 85, which is the danger zone for Alzheimer's and other dementias, Parkinson's and stroke. Now in the US, part of this has to do with it, what are called the baby boomers who uh, uh, men came back after World War II and they got married and had kids, their wives had kids. And so there are a lot of kids born, um, whatever that is now, 50, 50, 60 years uh, ago. Uh, but part of the reason for this increased number of people is that advances in cardiovascular disease research, uh, cancer research has enabled early diagnosis and treatment, even diabetes, so that people who would have previously died in this age range are now living into this age range and are at high risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the brain shrinks and particularly the temporal lobe, frontal lobe and uh, certain subcortical structures, uh, particularly the hippocampus and associated brain regions and uh, another re uh, regions that are called the default mode network. But anyway, now it was shown early on by using PET imaging with radio labeled glucose or 2-deoxyglucose that there's a dramatic decrease in glucose utilization in the brains of AD patients compared to controls and it correlates with the regions that shrink. Now, part of this can be explained by death of neurons, but it turns out that patients with mild cognitive impairment, which have uh, even 
patients with minimal reduction in gray matter have reduced glucose utilization. Now there is some correlation between deposition of A beta plaques, amyloid plaques and tangles, brain shrinkage, and reduced glucose utilization. Um, which comes first? Not completely clear. We do know from work in my lab uh, more than 20 years ago that if you take cultured neurons and expose them to amyloid beta peptide, it impairs glucose transport in the neurons, that is their ability to take up glucose. So uh, A beta may contribute to impaired glucose uh, utilization, but on the other hand, and it, we did, did other experiments. If you if you block or reduce glucose availability to neurons, then they're more vulnerable to being damaged and killed by amyloid beta peptide. Okay, so getting back to uh, potential ways of reducing risk for Alzheimer's, there's pretty good evidence that regular exercise throughout adult life uh, may reduce risk. Um, also keeping the mind intellectually challenged. And then I'm gonna focus on intermittent fasting. So with fasting and also extended vigorous exercise, there's glycogen depletion from the liver and then uh, fats, sorry, fat cells and dipocytes release free fatty acids into the blood. Those then go into the liver and are converted to ketones, acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. There are transporters that transport the ketones um, across the blood-brain barrier and into neurons. These are called MCTs, monocarboxylic acid transporters. Uh, we and others have done studies of neurons uh, showing that beta-hydroxybutyrate can sustain ATP levels in neurons even when you reduce the glucose availability to the neurons. Uh, my lab and Moses Chow's lab up at NYU showed that um, that beta-hydroxybutyrate, this ketone, can stimulate the expression, a production of a protein called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, and there's a huge literature showing that BDNF uh, is critical for learning and memory. Uh, stress resistance, and uh, we found BDNF can stimulate an increase in the number of mitochondria in neurons. So in, uh, my point here is in addition to providing energy to neurons, the ketones seem to have a signaling function uh, of which, among which the increase in BDNF levels is one. Uh, Steve Kunal up in Canada has done uh, beautiful uh, PET imaging studies. He actually has more recent data, which um, actually just published. I guess I could have put in this paper. But anyway, in this study, what he did is he took, uh, now these are just normal, healthy uh, people, and he infused. Uh, radio labeled acetoacetate, the ketone, which he can use to determine the cerebral metabolic rate uh, for this ketone. And he, in these same people, he infused radio labeled 2-deoxyglucose to get cerebral metabolic rate for glucose. Then what he did is he put, uh, essentially deprived them of carbohydrates, put them on a ketogenic diet, that elevates ketones. Uh, and so what he found is that uh, when 
when the people are on a carbohydrate containing diet, their brain cells use very little ketones. They use mainly, perhaps mostly exclusively glucose. However, when they're on ketogenic diet, uh, they, they switch their, uh, they, um, sorry, I, I got this mixed up, I'm sorry. This is the ketones in the upper. So when he switches to the ketogenic diet, they, they use ketones and they, the utilization of glucose goes down. The point being that brain cells can utilize either glucose or ketones. And then he even showed that in, in people who are, were fasting long term, in this case 40 days, in which the plasma ketones are way up, the, the brain cells are using those ketones as an energy source and, and perhaps if our data applies to humans uh, to increase production of BDNF and promote synaptic plasticity. We did a study where we, we essentially we fed mice, uh, mouse model Alzheimer's disease that develops A beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangle-like pathology and cognitive impairment. We fed them a ketone ester and found in this fear conditioning test that the ketone ester improved their learning and memory are actually uh, reversed, uh, uh, ameliorated their cognitive decline. And also we found that these mice, these three XTGAD mice have anxiety-like behaviors and that the ketones uh, inhibit anxiety in this open field test. I'm not going to go through the data. Uh, these were published and I, I want to focus on the main theme. In this study we took diabetic mice. Diabetic, diabetes is a risk factor, type 2 diabetes for mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, these mice have a mutation in the leptin receptor which is a hormone when you eat, it goes, levels go up and it goes to your brain and tells you you're full, stop eating. So these mice don't get the stop eating signal and they overeat and become obese and diabetic. And then we had normal wild type mice and we divided the mice into four different conditions, ad libitum feeding sedentary, ad libitum feeding running wheels in the cage, daily calorie restriction or actually fasting, daily fasting, uh, sedentary and daily fasting running and we let them go for three months and then uh, we took out one hippocampus and we essentially quantified numbers of synapses by counting these postsynaptic uh, spines. On, on hippocampal dentate gyrus neurons and found that both the calorie restriction uh, or daily fast intermittent fasting and the running increased number of synapses and there was an additive effect. This is wild type mice, this is a diabetic mice. Uh, you can also see the diabetic mice have lower number of synapses compared to the wild type mice. And then in the other hippocampus, uh, we measured BDNF levels, which were up in response to running intermittent fasting. And then uh, this is just the data side where Christina Morosi, postdoc in my lab, showed that this ketone beta hydroxybutyrate will stimulate BDNF gene expression when we culture cells in, uh, in uh, one millimolar glucose, but not very high levels of glucose, which is like diabetes levels. Uh, so anyway, this is kind of a fasting type condition. This is more diabetes. Okay, uh, in this study, 
I, I'm not going to show you the data, but we showed that BDNF can cause an increase in the number of mitochondria in neurons. There's re the red here is mitochondria labeled with a fluorescent probe. So we expose these cultured neurons to BDNF, the number of mitochondria increase, and we can prevent that by blocking uh, uh, a gene called PGC1-alpha, which is essential for what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, an increase in number of mitochondria. So if we block the ability of these neurons to generate more mitochondria, it impairs synapse formation and it blocks the ability of BDNF to stimulate synapse formation. Okay, so in our first study of intermittent fasting in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, what we did is we took three XTGAD mice and beginning at five months of age, we put them on uh, in one of four conditions, uh, or, or sorry, three conditions, ad libitum feeding, uh, alternate day fasting, intermittent fasting, or daily calorie restriction fast fasting. And then we also had some normal mice, non-Alzheimer's mice. And we let them go for a year under these conditions. And then we tested their learning and memory in the water maze. And the bottom line here is that compared to the Alzheimer's mice fed ad libitum, those on every other day intermittent fasting or daily calorie restriction slash daily fasting uh, perform much better actually the, similar to normal mice. So the conclusion here is in this mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, long-term intermittent fasting can, uh, uh, can't say prevent for sure, but certainly greatly delay the onset of cognitive impairment. Okay, in, in this uh, paper that we recently published, Rafa de Cabo and I review article. This is a, a working model of, of what happens during periods of fasting and periods of recovery. So uh, during the fasting, during recovery. So the recovery is eating and sleeping. So fasting causes increase in ketones, uh, mitochondrial stress resistance, uh, some things I didn't talk about, stimulates autophagy, which is removal of garbage from cells, enhances, stimulates DNA repair, and decreases overall protein synthesis in the cell. So during the fasting, the cells go into a stress resistance, repair, recycle, but don't grow mode. Then during recovery, eating and sleeping, the cells go into a, uh, a growth mode. They have increased protein synthesis. We think it's during this recovery period actually where new synapses form and a number of mitochondria increase. But if the individual had not fasted, the signaling pathways that can, that can stimulate the growth uh, and, and robustness of the neurons are never activated. And this is similar to exercise where it's not during the period of exercise that your muscles grow and get stronger, it's during the recovery. But if you don't exercise, then you don't get an increase in the size of the muscle when you rest. So it's the same kind of idea. Uh, since you have a, a varied audience, uh, this slide I'm not going to go into much detail except to say that exercise can increase the number of new neurons in a brain region, uh, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, uh, and that was shown by Henriette von Prague, uh, and this is some of her, her data showing that 
exercise, running wheel exercise, increases the number of new neurons that functionally integrate into these neural circuits in the hippocampus. And we have evidence that that's also true with intermittent fasting. So intermittent exercise, intermittent fasting may not only uh, be neuroprotective and uh, promote formation and maintenance of synapses, at least in this brain region, it may promote an increase in the number of new neurons that uh, play important roles in learning and memory. Uh, so what about humans? Um, there's actually quite a bit of data with exercise and cognitive function in elderly people. These are some data from um, uh, Art Kramer in Chicago uh, showing that uh, he, he took patients with uh, their cognitively normal or mild cognitive impairment and he put them uh, for three to six months of this exercise program where he actually has them uh, move through their environment uh, while they're exercising. So he's, and, and, and think about where they're, the route they're going. So the, the idea is that it's more of a natural type exercise where you're physically moving through an environment and thinking about where you're going. Uh, kind of like hunter-gatherers. And the bottom line is he found uh, highly significant improvements in, uh, in uh, uh, cognitive function uh, and that, that occurred earlier. Uh, what, oh, sorry, I'm a little complicated. He actually had two exercise groups. One exercise where they're moving through their environment, one when they're not. And, by six months, both of them improved cognition, but it was more rapid improvement in the um, group moving through the natural environment while they're exercising. Uh, in this study, we found that uh, a certain enzyme in mitochondria of neurons is, uh, its levels increase in response to exercise in the brain and that increase requires activity in neural networks because we can block it by giving mice, the mice which were used in these studies, a drug that uh, reduces activation of a particular type of excitatory transmitter receptor called the NMDA glutamate receptor. NM glutamate's the major excitatory, it's actually the excitatory neurotransmitter throughout the brain. The most important neurotransmitter in our brain is glutamate. Much more important than serotonin, dopamine, etc. You can't survive at all without glutamate. Um, and but and we, we use CERT3 knockout mice to show that um, the ability of exercise to protect and promote resilience of these neurons, it requires this mitochondrial enzyme CERT3. Um, so this is just an example showing that glutamate and activation of glutamate stimulates production of CERT3 in a glutamate receptor agonist dose dependent manner. And, uh, and this shows that exercise running wheel exercise increases CERT3 in the cortex and hippocampus of mice. Uh, we show that in cultured neurons, uh, lacking CERT3 uh, are more vulnerable to being killed by glutamate receptor agonists, glutamate, canic acid, and NMDA. More neurons die if they don't have CERT3. And we can, um, we also showed that if we overexpress CERT3, then fewer neurons die. And we showed this in vivo in a, a model of epileptic seizures, which is actually very relevant to Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's neural network hyperexcitability that occurs early in Alzheimer's disease. 
That is to say, uh, unconstrained or not well constrained overactivation of glutamate receptors. Uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease have greatly increased risk for epileptic seizures and studies uh, of humans looking at EEG and animals looking at animal models show that hyperexcitability occurs very early in Alzheimer's disease and in my opinion contributes to the degeneration and death. But anyway, we show that in this study that mitochondrial CERT3 uh, is a, can protect neurons against hyperexcitability. How does it do this? Well, actually in this study we showed that intermittent fasting increases CERT3 levels in neurons in the hippocampus and that the intermittent fasting, uh, this is just showing the intermittent fasting increases CERT3 protein levels, not right away, uh, but by a month, there's a, a, a intermittent fasting, there's a big increase in CERT3. And what we did is we recorded activity of GABA synapses, Again, uh, glutamate's the major excitatory neurotransmitter, GABA, the major inhibitory transmitter. And so we're recording, patch clamp recording, hippocampal CA1 neurons, looking at what are called IPSCs, inhibitory postsynaptic currents. What we see is that animals adapted to intermittent fasting have increased activation of GABA receptors compared to ad libitum fed animals. The point being here that we think that the intermittent fasting is beefing up or enhancing uh, the constraint of neural networks and keeping it within normal limits. Um, and then we also show there's some improvement in uh, learning and memory in, in wild type animals on intermittent fasting, but not CERT3 knockout animals on intermittent fasting. And then we actually measured LTP, which was impaired in CERT3 knockout mice uh, uh, compared to wild type mice. Okay, I, I probably should have put this slide a, a while back, but major excitatory neurons in the brain use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. Inhibitory neurons use GABA. These inhibitory neurons can be identified histologically based on their expression of uh, the proteins parvalbumin, somatostatin, and another one called uh, calretinin. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so. In this study, what we showed is that in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, APP PS1 mice, uh, we're recording electroencephalogram and find that these mice often show hyperexcitability by EEG. And if we reduce CERT3 levels by 50% by mating APP PS1 mice with CERT3 knockout mice, then there's a big increase in not only EEG seizure activity, but clinically documented seizures. And these animals die from the seizures at an early age by, uh, you know, relatively young animals are dying from seizures when they have accumulation of amyloid in combination with reduced levels of this critical mitochondrial protein. And then the, CERT, the APP PS1 mice uh, that have reduced levels of CERT3, they have loss of <coughs> parvalbumin and calreticulin expression neurons. So this is the uh, parvalbumin containing neurons. This is calreticulin. So Probably one reason for the hyperexcitability of neural networks is 
that there's degeneration of these critical GABAergic inhibitory neurons. And in fact, there's some evidence that these neurons uh, that express parvalbumin and calretinin degenerate early in Alzheimer's disease, perhaps even pre-symptomatically. And then finally, we show that this ketone ester, if we give these animals a ketone ester, um, whereas they normally die because it, they develop severe seizures, they don't develop seizures and die if they have the ketone ester. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here pretty quickly now. Uh, I'm going I'm to skip this because I want to get to question. Oh, no, I'm almost done. Um, this slide, uh, it's a little complicated, but so I showed some data showing ketone ester has benefits in animal models uh, of Alzheimer's disease and that uh, elevated ketones, uh, the, these ketones can be used in the human brain for energy. But there's also certain drugs and approaches to mimic some of the effects of intermittent fasting. And they're shown here. And these have been tested in animal models. In some cases, they're going to be tested in, in human studies. So these are some new approaches, pharmacological approaches uh, for AD risk reduction and perhaps uh, treatment. Okay, what about humans? We have an ongoing study headed by Dimitrios Kapagianis uh, that are showing some promising early results where we put humans at risk for cognitive impairment because they are obese and insulin resistant. We put them on either 5-2 intermittent fasting or a control diet, which is advice for healthy eating. Then at baseline in two months, we do battery of cognitive tests and we find that there's greater improvement from baseline in at least some measures of cognitive function in the subjects on intermittent fasting. And the study's not done yet. So this can be taken as preliminary data, <coughs> but we're, until we get the total number of subjects in the study, uh, you know, I'm not, we're not obviously gonna publish it, but this is just for FYI at this time. Okay, so I've focused on the brain, but most of the study in humans of intermittent fasting have not been at the brain, looking at the brain, it's been looking at other organ systems. Uh, for example, we initially showed in animals that intermittent fasting can enhance parasympathetic tone, reduce resting heart rate and blood pressure, and that's because intermittent fasting is increasing activity in these brainstem cholinergic neurons that innervate the heart. This is actually similar to endurance training, which lowers resting heart rate, lowers blood pressure through, through the same parasympathetic system-based mechanism. These are some of the data in animals. Uh, Luigi Fontana has shown that this is also true in humans, that is, intermittent fasting can lower blood pressure uh, and and increase heart rate variability. Um, and uh, there are many trials ongoing in various diseases. I put this as, we put this as a supplement to our New England Journal article, some of the ongoing trials of intermittent fasting. A lot of it's focused on obesity, diabetes, uh, cancers. Uh, but there's some focusing on cognitive impairment and since type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance uh, and probably obesity, which goes hand in hand with these, are risk factors for cognitive impairment, then, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Okay, my final slide. Uh, so what about a medical practice? There's, a, there's quite a bit of uh, movement in addition to the clinical trials in uh, trying to in incorporate at least 
in some places intermittent fasting into medical practice as a complement to exercise, a healthy diet, and in the case of the brain, keeping intellectually challenged. So how might this occur? Well, Johns Hopkins, uh, for the last um, uh, five years or so, I've been giving uh, lectures to the uh, medical students on uh, the focuses on intermittent fasting and, and the science behind it, and what's known in human studies, uh, uh, which look promising with regards to obesity, diabetes, we'll see with other uh, disorders. Uh, so one is, you know, start at the beginning. Uh, so medical education definitely needs to expand uh, information on how people can reduce their risk. And then in practice, they, the physicians need to be able to not only prescribe particular exercise, intermittent fasting uh, regimens and give, the, give their patients some choices. For example, in this could give the patient a choice of daily time-restricted eating, perhaps uh, fasting for 16 to 18 hours every day, or two days a week fasting. And then over a period of several months, you kind of uh, ease them into this final goal uh, uh, of daily time restricted feeding, intermittent fasting. And, and then you follow up and you, through social media, uh, texting and so on, particularly during this first month, which in, in the human studies I've been involved with, if, if you can encourage people and help them switch their eating pattern during a one month period, they can fully adapt so that they're no longer hungry and irritable during the time periods that they previously would have been eating. And I should mention all of the effects that we've seen in animals, whether it's on the brain or body, take two to four weeks in order to become statistically significant. And that includes hunger. And it includes the, the upregulation of GABAergic tone in the brain. It includes insulin sensitivity and reductions in blood pressure and heart rate. So this first month is, is critical. So if, if, if there's one take home message I'd like to leave you with, it, it's that. Uh, thank you very much. This was my lab, actually quite a few, it's like seven years ago uh, at NIA. Um, this is an older picture of uh, uh, Hopkins Neuroscience uh, Group. Saul Snyder was the uh, head when I started. It's been taken over by Rick Hugener, uh, a really good group. And this was my running group. Um, at NIA five years ago. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Professor Madsen. That was, that was a very interesting presentation. Now uh, we have a few questions from the audience. I'll read it out for you. So uh, the first question is, uh, how does one measure or count dendritic spines or neurons? What technique did you use? Yes. Uh, there's a famous Italian neuroscientist uh, named Camillo Golgi, and we used his technique. It's a silver staining based method that Ramoni Cajal uh, <laughs> essentially, the, the, the single person who showed what neurons look like throughout the brain uh, used. So it's Golgi staining. Uh, and the next question is, what will be the effect of intermittent fasting for people having a high blood sugar or uh, high blood pressure? Good effect. Okay. I hope that answers the question. And uh, uh, the other question is, is there a direct relationship between a keto diet and BDNF expression in hippocampus? If so, what is the mechanism? Is uh, CREB involved? Is what involved? 
I think CREB involved, C-R-E-B. Ah, yeah, that's a good question. There's no data on BDNF levels uh, in human brain uh, and, and ketogenic diet, and actually it'd have to be in cerebrospinal fluid. In animals, well, n n not, not a ketogenic diet, just actually administering the ketone directly into the brain or through the diet. Uh, sorry, not through the diet. We, did we do that? I don't think so, but Kreb, yeah. So Kreb is a transcription factor that's well known to stimulate BDNF expression, and it's, it's wow. activated by actually activity in neural circuits, calcium influx, and um, so it could be one transcription factor. We have some evidence that NF kappa B is involved. Uh, we'd shown, uh, actually, Anne Marini had shown that NF-kappa B induces BDNF expression. So it could be CRAB and or NF-kappa B. Okay, I hope that answers the question. And do the benefits of fasting differ from adult versus children? Ah, that's an important question. Uh, there are no studies that I'm aware of, of intermittent fasting in children. There are physicians, uh, this is just anecdotal, I've been contacted by more than one pediatrician that work with families where the, the, they have children that are obese. And they are finding that what, what they do is they work with the parents and, and the, the child and get them both to switch their eating pattern to intermittent fasting so that now both the, the child with obesity and their parents are on the same eating pattern. And, but there's no published data. Um, um, so I, I guess from the standpoint of children, if they're overweight, then it's, it should, in theory, be beneficial, but there's no published data. Okay, and I would like to add uh, to this uh, to that question: uh, Is there any difference between men and women? The effect of intermittent fasting on men and women? In the human stu in human studies, there's no clear differences. Um, improvements in glucose regulation, uh, reductions in, in abdominal fat, um, and, and yeah, so I, I'm not aware now. I think it's no, no problem in, in women that are overweight. Um, if a woman already has a low body mass index, we, we don't, the answer is we don't know. Okay. Intuitively, you might think it might be a bad idea, but on the other hand, we don't know. I, I mean, it's, you know, we, pregnant women is another question. Um, the advice that, that OBGYN doctors would give to pregnant women for a long time was uh, don't overexert yourself, you know, don't exercise. Um, that was actually the advice given to patients who had a heart, have had a heart attack. Uh, now we know that's bad advice. You, you want to be healthy after you had a heart attack. You want to be healthy when you're pregnant. And in fact, um, poor metabolic health during pregnancy is a risk factor for poor outcomes in the child, including autism. You know, so, um, you know, at, at this point, contraindications would be people with a, you know, very low, you know, already borderline uh, starvation body mass index or 
elderly people who are, are becoming frail and have very low body mass index. Although we don't know, you know, there is evidence from resistance training studies that intermittent fasting is conducive to, to building muscle as long as you exercise. Okay, and uh, are there diet effects on uh, inflammation and neuroinflammation? Yes. Ah, systemic inflammation in humans, yes. Brain and systemic inflammation in animals, yes. R reducing levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, like tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1 beta. Okay. Now, uh, we don't know about immune responses yet. Okay. In other words, you know, uh, if you're infected with COVID-19, intermittent fasting may reduce, you know, innate systemic inflammation, but which should be good for the lungs as far as that, you know, but as far as the immune response to the virus itself, that is, you know, mm -hmm. we don't know. That's, uh, and that's actually a, an interesting question, right? Uh, in the case of COVID-19. Now, the risk factors for poor outcomes with COVID-19 are obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, inflammatory conditions such as asthma. You know, so in as much as the intermittent fasting you know, has good effects on those risk factors, at least as if people have those risk factors, since this virus is going to be around for a while, you know, they, they should consider getting exercise and, and if they're overweight or have poor blood, blood glucose regulation, probably, possibly intermittent fasting. So that if they do happen to uh, get the virus, they're more likely to have a better outcome. Yes, and how will a keto diet impact lipids? What's that? Uh, how will a keto diet impact lipids? Uh, this is an important question, you know. Uh, so when the ketogenic diet became popular, you know, people were not too careful on what fats they were eating. And uh, this is my opinion. I'm not an expert on this field, but my opinion is that the data is still pretty good that excess, excess saturated fatty acids is not good. Certainly trans fatty acids are not good. That's why they're not used anymore. Uh, the evidence is strong that omega-3 fatty acids are good. So my own opinion would be is if, some, if someone's on a ketogenic diet, they should focus on the omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, in most cases, not getting too much protein. You know, high protein in the diet if you're a bodybuilder, that can be good in the short term. But if you're if, if you're more interested in your long-term health, high protein in the diet is bad. Okay. Uh, so that that's what I'd say about that. Uh, so a uh, high protein in the diet is bad for is uh, bad for for any particular reason. Like, is it because it uh, it causes a lot of uh, pressure on kidneys and uh, other organ or are there any other uh, reasons for which uh, we should avoid taking too much proteins? Okay, so uh, can I share my screen again? Yeah, sure. Um, geez, what was I going to do? Uh, yeah. You see my screen? Mm, not yet. No? No, no. You cannot see your screen. Are you sharing your screen? No, I don't think. Uh, no, we are not sharing our screen.
Yes, we can, we can see it now. Okay, so if we go back to this slide and focus on this one thing here, mTOR and protein synthesis. Well, and autophagy too. Okay, so one of the main the stimulators of mTOR is a pathway uh, whereby amino acids that are taken up by cells are used for protein synthesis. So when mTOR is active, levels of protein synthesis go up, but at the same time, autophagy goes down. So if you're constantly activating the mTOR pathway, uh, which the amino acids from high protein diets will do, then you're re impairing the ability of your cells to clear out potentially pathological proteins like tau maybe, okay. or A beta, or amylin in the liver. Um, so that's the point. And uh, you know, high protein diet will, will tend to tip the scale towards too much activation of the mTOR protein. So it's like uh, the, the cells are in a, const a constant growth mode and their stress resistance and, and recycling mechanisms are relatively suppressed. Okay, so uh, our next question is, what about syst uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome? sepsis, delirium, and sepsis-associated encephalopathy as a risk factor to AD? Oh. I can't answer that question. I'm not, I'm not up on... Now, those would be epidemiological studies, mm -hmm. seeing if patients who had experienced sepsis and survived uh, were at increased risk. Is that what the question is? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's complicated. Um, the people who survive sepsis, there's often, so the bacteria, of course, they're circulating in the, in the bloodstream and, and oftentimes they'll accumulate in smaller vessels, including in the brain. Um, so there can be vascular complications after sepsis, which may, you know, predispose to stroke or maybe vascular. Uh, I'm kind of just free associating here, actually. But uh, so I, let, let's just leave it at that. I, I, I'm not aware of any data, but you know, I'd say just go on PubMed and put in sepsis risk, cognitive impairment, whatever, and see. Okay. And would you consider that, would you consider that an appropriate conclusion drawn from the data exposed is that we should adopt an intermittent fasting diet regardless of our current health conditions? I can't, uh, that's a little bit too, uh, you know, determinant. Um, I, I can't say that. I, I mentioned, you know, being frail. Uh, yeah, uh, another issue is type 1 diabetes. You know, obviously, you know, if, if you're fasting and you're taking insulin, then the hypoglycemic effect of the insulin, you know, you, you may have more excursions into the hypoglycemic zone. And, and But on the other hand, if you were closely monitored with your physician, say over a period of month of trans, and, and uh, in theory, you could probably end up taking less insulin. Um, because the intermittent fasting increases insulin sensitivity. So, 
there's probably a literature with exercise, I would assume. Uh, I don't know this, but I would hypothesize that if an individual, so say there's a high school kid that decides he's been sedentary and he decides to start running cross country. My guess would be that as he gets in shape and his insulin sensitivity increases, that he's going to have to reduce the amount of insulin or, or whatever, be more careful, you know, you know, have the glu glucose. I can, you know, so I think that um, even with type one diabetes, there's, I, I don't think we should assume that it, it might not be appropriate in as much as exercise does seem to be okay. You just have to be more careful. Okay. So uh, do exo exosomes have any utility in this field? Are they used to measure proteins such as BDNF? The answer is yes. And that's uh, an exciting area. My colleague Dimitros Kapagianis at NIA has done a lot of work on that in relation to Alzheimer's disease. And he's been able to take the total pool of circulating extracellular vesicles or exosomes. And from those total vesicles floating around in the blood, he pulls down vesicles using an antibody against a neuron specific protein. So he, he can isolate vesicles that are probably coming from neurons and somewhere, could be CNS, PNS, and are in the circulation. And then he probed those with antibodies against A, beta, tau, and, and shown that uh, at least in two studies, there's fairly good uh, diagnostic and predictive uh, um, results in, in, in measuring tau and A-beta in these vesicles uh, with regards to mild cognitive impairment in AD. So his most recent study was from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging where he had uh, you know, blood samples from people even decades, uh, many, many years before they were diagnosed with MCI or AD. And then you, know, you compared to others who age matched. And so, yeah, that's an exciting area. Okay. And if diabetes, so if diabetes mellitus is controlled, will it still be a risk for Alzheimer's disease? Kindly uh, talk a little on diabetes uh, induced Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, so, yeah, I, my understanding is there are data that uh, people who control their diabetes uh, with GLP-1 analogs or metformin are at reduced risk for cognitive impairment as they get older. Um, on the other hand, if you can control your blood glucose without drugs, that's better. Okay. And NFK beta is a inflammatory transcription factor. Does or does it increase the BDNF, which is neuroprotective? Yes. Okay. NF kappa B was discovered by immunologists uh, as being involved in an Reducing expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, but it, it, its actions are much more broad. Essentially, it's a stress response protein. Okay. When cells are under stress, including neurons, NF kappa B is activated. Uh, some of its targets, in addition to BDNF, are survival proteins such as BCL2. Uh, and, and some others. So it's a case where people need to keep a broad view of things. Just because something was discovered to have one function 
that doesn't mean it's only that's its only function and actually in many cases uh, it turns out one protein and of course it's a transcription factor so obviously it can but even with other proteins that aren't transcription factors they can have more than one function okay and uh, are there any studies which affect uh, which uh, which study the effect of intermittent fasting on an already Alzheimer's patient? No. Okay. So, uh, but I think there uh, there is a clinical trials going on uh, on keto diet on Alzheimer's patient. Is that yes. correct? Yes, that's correct. There's already published studies. Uh, ah, I think it was MCI patients with. Uh, medium chain triglycerides, which are precursors to ketones. And then Steve Kanan has a trial. I don't know if it started, but it's definitely going to happen in of giving that same ketone ester that we used in our animal models, uh, which is, it's commercially available now, that ketone ester uh, to AD patients. And then there's some anecdotal data on AD patients that have taken the ketone ester. and but. It, you know, that's anecdotal, but yeah, so there will be trials. Okay, and I want to add uh, add to that question, like uh, when we are giving a keto diet or when we are going on a intermittent fasting, uh, finally we are looking to increase the ketone level in the, in the blood. So is there any difference in metabolic pathway that how our body takes the ketone from the keto diet and the intermittent fasting like because uh, you said you said that ketones so normally what they do they increase the bdnf level so if we have the ketones from uh, from ketogenic diet and the uh, same ketones will be having from intermittent fasting so will they have the same effect uh there's pro there's overlapping effects uh, certainly with regards to being an energy source for neurons probably, apparently, at least based on the animal data, uh, in terms of VDNF expression. On the other hand, uh, you know, it, uh, more work needs to be done. Uh, it's my guess that all of the beneficial effects of intermittent fasting and exercise on the, on the brain cannot be explained simply by ketones. And certainly in the case of exercise, there's evidence it, in animals, ad libitum fed animals that have a carbohydrate rich diet, exercise is still beneficial for the brain even when there's no elevation in ketones. Probably same in humans. Um, and again, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, you know, it seems like, like there, there's so many pathways and changes that are going on with exercise and fasting that the ketones are only one piece of the puzzle. Okay. Okay, okay. so uh, we have we have few more questions. I'm, uh, uh, it was such an exciting talk, interesting talk that I'm getting a lot of questions now. I'm not sure whether whether you're still available to answer all that, all those questions. Do you still have some time to answer the question or do you want me to send an email to you to address those questions? I'll do two more. Okay. So are there any uh, correlation between insulin pathways and BDNF? Oh my gosh, I should know this. Okay, so insulin and uh, IGFs act through uh, PI3 kinase AKT pathway primarily, and there are some interactions with BDNF downstream, BDNF uh, downstream of that. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good question. Studies need to be done where, you know, combining BDNF with insulin or insulin-like growth factors or 
blocking specifically or reducing BDNF signaling and then seeing if that modifies the effects of insulin or IGFs or vice versa. And those kinds of experiments would be straightforward in cultured neurons. Um, in animals, you'd have to have uh, either gene knockout or RNA interference. Uh, and in humans, they're very difficult. Okay, so we have one, one last question and I would like to ask the question which I was having. So uh, as you said that uh, both intermittent fasting and exercise increases uh, the BDNF level and uh, then it increases SIRT3 protein level. So is there any uh, uh, difference in the pathway how these both are released in uh, intermittent fasting and exercise? Oh. Is there a difference between exercise and intermittent fasting? Yes, the, the way uh, BDNS and, uh, yeah. and SIRT3 proteins are released. Well, I, we don't have the answer to that. That, ha that hasn't been looked at. Uh, it's a good question. Um, yeah, you know, so for example, with exercise and CERT3 expression, we showed that glutamate receptor activation was essential. Um, that hasn't been done. We didn't do that with exercise. And so there's, there's some missing, some gaps, gaps in, in knowledge in that area. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Ma uh, Mark, for your time. And it was, uh, it was such an interesting presentation. Thank you so much for your time and being here. And uh, we'll be organizing a few more online meetings like this on preventing Alzheimer's. I hope you can join us in our future, future meeting also. Okay, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Stay safe. Thank you, Professor Mark. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, if you have any suggestions or feedback, uh, we would like uh, we would love to hear from you. And uh, maybe we can work on on those suggestions to improve in our future uh, online meetings. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice day. And uh, stay safe. Stay healthy.